So this is the last lecture we're gonna do on, on OHP indexes. So today's focus is gonna be on tri data structures, which are now becoming more, uh, people are giving you more attention in the context of, of in-memory databases because they have certain properties that we'll cover today that are unique to, uh, or, or more interesting or potentially better than, than the B plus tree stuff we talked about so far. Um, so for today's lecture, I want to start off talking about uh, just some more generic uh, implementation issues we got to deal with when we actually want to build a uh, in-memory index. So these first part here aren't going to be specific to the art indexes. We're mostly going to be describing them in the context of B plus trees. But then it, uh, some of it will then help motivate what we end up talking about the the tries later on. So when we talk about tri data structures, we're going to talk about uh, primarily two variants, the Judy arrays and the art index, which is the paper you guys read, and then we'll finish up very quickly with just mentioning what the mass tree is, because I think it's a, it'll, it'll sort of tie in nicely together all the things we talked about from last class and this class uh, into a single data structure. All right, so, you know, when you take the introduction class, we have you guys build a B plus tree, um, but we don't really get into the, the nitty gritty details of how do you actually make the B plus tree usable throughout the entire system. So now we actually want to build a real database system, and now we got to say, well, how the hell are we actually going to make the B plus tree or make, it, make our index uh, function with the other parts of the system? So for this, I want to start off talking about different ways to manage memory, the garbage collection and memory pools. For the garbage collection stuff, it's just going to be a sort of a, a repeat of what we talked about last time, the IPEC-based garbage collection. But then we talk about how to reclaim memory. And then we'll talk about how you, ways to actually store non-unique keys and variable length keys. And again, we need these for MVCC. We need these if you want to store strings. And then we'll see techniques to actually reduce the size of the, of the data or the keys we're actually storing in our, in our B plus tree nodes. And then from this, we'll see why we want to do something like, like a try or the radix tree. So last class, we talked about latch tree data structures. And the, the thing we talked about was that we, we stressed was that latch tree is nice because you don't have to hold heavyweight latches while you make changes to the data structure. But now, since you don't have any protection mechanisms on the actual latches or on the nodes, you don't know who could be reading the particular node or that part of the index that you're modifying, right? So we saw this example here. It's the same you have like a, a really simple skip list, and we want to delete this key here. But say there's another thread that's scanning along the leaf nodes, we blow this away before we update this pointer here. And then now our thread tries to read this pointer and it follows to an invalid memory location. And if, if we're lucky, we read garbage data, which is still bad. Worst case scenario, we get a seg fault and our, our program crashes. So again, the reason why is because we're not keeping any kind of global track uh, we're not keeping a global uh, tracking information about what threads are reading. Uh, so, we, so we have to make sure that we do things in the right order and make sure that we reclaim pieces of our index, the nodes in our index, once we know it's safe to do so. So this is what garbage collection is going to do for us. And so there's a bunch of different ways to do this. The most common ones are reference counting, epoch-based reclamation, which we talked about last class, hazard pointers. But there's a, a bunch of other ones that, that you can do as well. So in the context of in-memory databases, we're just going to focus on these two. These are not that common, or these are the most common for, for in-memory, in -memory, actually, really any data structure for in-memory database. Uh, hazard pointers, less so. Um, this is, mostly comes up in sort of operating systems and other programs. So we're going to focus on these two. And then, like I said, there's a whole bunch of other techniques that people have developed over the years uh, to, to do this kind of thing. All right, so the, the, most e the easiest way to keep track of what threads are reading what pieces of data is just to maintain a counter on every single node in our data structure that we just increment any time a thread reads it. So if I'm scanning along the leaf node, I, I want to jump, follow a pointer to go to the next node. Before I actually do the jump, I want to maybe flip a pointer and say I'm reading this. Or sorry, fl flip a counter and say I'm reading this. And then when we're done, we just go ahead and decrement it. And so now when a uh, our garbage collector comes along and wants to reclaim this memory, because if that counter is not zero, then it knows some thread is accessing it. If the counter is zero, then it knows that nobody's accessing it, and therefore it's safe to reclaim. 
So again, thinking in the, in the context of the skip list, part of the reason I teach you the skip list is because it's really easy to understand uh, you know, th these kinds of issues or, or to conceptualize them. In the skip list case, we would mark a node as logically deleted. We flip a flag to say the thing's deleted. Now any thread that comes along would ignore it. But then we update the pointers to now route around it in our, in our each level in our linked list. So that now any other thread that comes along isn't actually going to even see that node. So in that case, with the, the count, it's not like the counter is going to be you know, greater than zero for a long time. It's going to be this small window where we could have something looking at it but, and we would blow it away and have, have memory problems. But in actuality, it's not going to that, be that big of a deal. So once this thing goes to zero, then we know it's safe to reclaim. So as, for as simple this, as this is, it actually turns out to be really bad or get terrible performance because if you not start scaling out the number of threads you have in a multi-core, multi-socket system, now you have all these threads that are reading and writing to these counters, which is going to be stored in some, some NUMA region in, in, in your motherboard. And now the, the, the motherboard, the, the CPU, is going to make sure that everybody's in sync anytime you update that counter. And that's going to send a bunch of cache invalidation uh, messages all between the different cores. And that's going to, get, that's going to be a, a, become a bottleneck, and that's going to prevent us from scaling. All right? If it's a single thread, who cares? But it now, if we're now dealing with maybe you know, 50 threads, then this becomes a, a big issue. So how can we do better than this? Right? We know the answer is going to be epoch-based garbage collection, but let's understand why. So the first thing we can point out is that we don't actually care to know what the exact value is for this counter. Right? I don't care whether it's one, one, two, four, eight. All I care about is whether it's zero or not zero. So incrementing the counter is going to cause all this cache invalidation messages sent out by the CPU because the CPU really wants to make sure that everyone is completely in sync and everyone sees the exact same value across all different threads, across all different cores. But we don't actually care about that. So that's, we're paying for this sort of extra uh, coherence across our, our threads that we don't really want. The other issue is that we don't really want to, don't need to perform garbage collection immediately when this counter reaches zero. And again, thinking in the context of the, the skip list, if I'm doing reference counting, I logically mark something as deleted, I route around it, and then once the reference count goes to zero, it's, you know, I don't need to immediately reclaim that. I can kind of do it at a, a, a later stage. Right? I'm not talking minutes. I'm really talking maybe milliseconds. The other aspect of this, too, is that um, you know, the size of this data we want to reclaim is not that big. Right? Most maybe you know, one or two kilobytes. Right? We're not talking about hundreds of megs that we need to reclaim right away to, to get the space. We're talking about a small, small number of, uh, of s s objects we want to clean up. So again, we don't need to stop the world while we do when something this counter goes to zero and immediately, immediately do garbage collection. So this is what the epoch-based garbage collection is designed for, right? So it's sort of a uh, it's a more coarse grain mechanism where we're just keeping track of what objects have been modified and invalidated or need to be cleaned up within a, a given time window. And once we know that there's no threads could be existing in that time window, it's safe for us to reclaim it. And this looks a lot like the garbage collection stuff we talked about at MVCC. Once we know that there's some old versions that can't be read by any active transaction within that snapshot, it's safe for us to reclaim it. So it's basically the same idea, but now done inside the index itself. So the way it works is basically you have this global epoch counter that you're periodically going to update every 10 milliseconds. Silo does it every 40 milliseconds. It doesn't matter. And this can be updated by a dedicated thread, or you could have one thread do this cooperatively. Again, it doesn't matter. And any time a thread wants to access their index, they just register themselves with the, the garbage collector and say, I'm now entering the index to do something at this, at this epoch. Does whatever it needs to do. If it, if it creates garbage, then it registers that with the garbage collector as well, again, within its epoch. And then when it leaves the index, it unregisters itself. And then the, the garbage collector says, all right, now, now there's one less thread in my in my index at this epoch. I don't know what it's actually reading, right? I don't need that fine grain access uh, information. I just say, I, I did, it just exists. It could be reading anything. And then once we know that all of the, uh, all of the 
threads within our epoch and all preceding epochs have gone away, then we can go through and, and clean up any garbage. Again, whether that's, whether that's done cooperatively or whether that's done with a background thread, it doesn't matter. So for in-memory indexes, this is the most common approach that everyone uses. Um, it's, it's used outside of databases as well, so inside the Linux kernel. And in the operating system world, they refer to the exact same idea, but they call it read, copy, update. And the Linux kernel uses this for some of its internal data structures. All right, so again, if we're going to build an in-memory index, epoch-based garbage collection is the way to go. But now, after we've identified what nodes we, we can garbage collect, now we need to decide what we actually do with that memory. So one thing we could do is just call free. Give it back to our memory allocator, which may or may not give it back to the operating system. So that would work, but this would suck because now we have to go into malloc, right? We have to go into our memory allocator and say, hey, here's some memory we can, you can have back. This also means that every time we need to create a new node, we call it a call malloc to get a new chunk of memory so that we can use that for our, our index. But that's bad too. We don't, we don't want to call malloc uh, nonstop because that's going to be slow because malloc's going to maintain its own internal data structures for its arenas, means it's going to have to protect them with its own latches, and that can, that can then become a bottleneck. The libc malloc is terrible. You always want to use je malloc or tc malloc. We use je malloc in our system. But it, as good as je malloc actually is, it's still not, you know, it, it's not free. Like it's going to have to protect its own stuff. So instead of doing this, we can actually maintain our own memory pools. The basic idea is that in our user space, in our database system, for our index, we just keep track of, here's a bunch of, uh, of, of pre-allocated no nodes that any time a thread asks for, to create a new node, it'll come to us and we, we can handle off one we already, already allocated. Right? And obviously, if our, if our pool runs out of space, we go back, we, then we go down to malloc and, and get more memory. Then when you want to delete a node, you just go hand it back to, to the memory allocator. Right? There's nothing magical here. It's just a way to avoid having to call malloc. And of course, now if we, say, insert a billion things and then delete a billion things, we want our index to actually get back memory. So in the same way we saw this with compaction in MVCC, we want to have some kind of mechanism in our memory pool allocator to be able to return memory back to the OS or back to malloc as needed. All right. Again, the main takeaway here is avoid calling malloc as much as possible, because that may end up being a syscall down to the kernel, and that would slow down our threads. All right, so now let's talk about how we actually want to store data in our indexes. So again, in, in the intro class, we're a bit hand wavy about all this, but now let's actually go into a bit more detail. And this matters for us because, as I said before, in MVCC, every index, even if it's the primary key or unique index, needs to be able to store non-unique keys because the same key might be inserted and deleted within a span of different snapshots. So how are we actually going to do this? So for this, I'll describe this in, in the context of V plus tree just because it's just easier to understand. Um, and this is all coming from this great book that's available online about modern B plus tree techniques. So this is, this is written by Gertz Graffy. Again, his name's going to come up multiple times throughout the semester. He'll do the Volcano stuff, the Cascades Query optimization, Optimizer. But he has this like free book. I think it's free. It was free to me. Um, <laughs> and it, like, it's like the go-to guide if you're going to build a B plus tree. This thing, it's like 200 pages. describes everything. It's awesome. All right, so there's two ways we can do this to store non-unique keys. So the first is that we just duplicate the key multiple times in, our, in our, our key array, and we just have a separate mapping to, our, to the pointer or the, the, the value slot for that corresponds to the pointer of that value. The alternative is to use value lists where we only store each key once, and then we just maintain an internal linked list or internal uh, array of all the values that correspond to that particular key. So visually, it looks like this. So here's the, here's the case when you have duplicate keys. So here's my sorted key array, and I have, the, I have the key K1 stored multiple times, and then the value array, again, these are just offsets. Uh, these offsets correspond to the offsets here to say that this key here belongs to, this key is mapped to this, this offset here, and then this is the pointer to, to our tuple. In the case of valueless, every key only exists once, and then these are just pointers now to some arbitrary variable length size list. Uh, for, all, for a given key, here's all the value pointers to it, right? We only have to do this in the leaf nodes. We don't have to do this in our inner nodes because in the inner nodes, the, the keys will be unique. Because again, they're just guideposts that tell us left and, whether to go left and right. 
We only have to do this in the, in, in the leaves. All right, the next issue is that we want to store variable length keys. So again, in, in the intro class, I think we just did fixed length keys. Uh, but now we actually want to store variable length keys. That gets slightly more complicated now inside of our node. So there's four different ways to do this. The easiest thing to do is just to store pointers, not actual values for our keys, just pointers to the tuple. Right, this is the same thing as the T tree we saw last class. Right, so if, I, if I'm traversing uh, a node, I want to say, what, what is this key I'm looking up? I'll have a pointer, a fixed length pointer, you know, 64 bits, that again, jump to the tuple, and then I can see what the actual key is. Right, and we said before, this sucks, you don't want to do this, because it's going to be a cache, uh, you know, cache line fill, or cache miss for every single time you, follow, you, you have to follow the pointer. And that's indirection, which is going to be bad for your instruction pipeline. The next approach is to do variable length nodes. And the idea here is that you could have different size nodes um, that are then you know, allocated based on what, what do you think the total amount of size you need to store in that particular node. And if it goes, uh, goes too big, then you can maybe increase the size of it. Um, the reason why this sucks is because now you have to have, and if you're doing a memory pool like we talked about before, now you have to have different size pools for all these different node sizes. Um, and then that way, when it, you know, you're going to have potentially more fragmented memory, uh, and this is harder to manage. So for this reason, nobody actually does this. The third approach is to do padding. And the idea here is you just store extra space for what you think the maximum size of the key should, could be for every single key. So if I, if I declare that I have a varchar 32, and then I insert a key that has is a varchar 16, I just pad out this, the remaining 16 characters to make it, make it so that it exactly fits you know, varchar 32. Then I don't, I don't have to worry about any of this other stuff because I know exactly how to jump to offsets in my node to find all the, you know, every particular key. And I know how many exactly keys I can store in each node. So as far as I know, nobody does this one either because this is pretty wasteful, right? A lot of times you see people write crappy applications where they'll say, you know, they'll, when they create their schema, they'll say, oh, it's a var char 1024, even though they want to store one character, right? They just store some large, large ass, uh, you know, get, allocate a large ass column size. And so if you're padding that out, you know, it's going to be all wasted space and you're going to get terrible performance. What's more common is the key map or indirection approach. And the basic idea here is that you just, uh, you embed the array of pointers to now map to the, the key value pairs within, within the node itself. And again, if you, when we took, discussed this in the introduction class, this, this is gonna look a lot like a slotted array for when we store tuples. All right, so it looks like this. So we have our sort of key map. This thing again, this, so these are the pointers or offsets into uh, into down our key value pair or key value pairs here, right? And then think of this as like the end of the node. So I'm gonna as I add new entries into this node, I'm gonna grow it from the end to the beginning, and I keep going until I butt up against this thing to say I, I ran out of space, right? So the sort of key map, this thing always has to be in sort of order based on the keys. This can be stored in any arbitrary order, right? So if I want to say find the first entry here, this is just an offset down to this, right? So what's one potential problem with this? He says values can be very large. I'm not worried about that, right? If values are super large, then you typically just have an overflow chain. You allocate new space, and, and then this is actually a pointer and say, hey, the, either the, the entire key you want or the rest of the key you're looking for is over here. That sucks, but that's unavoidable. Yes? Deletes can cause fragmentation. He says deletes can call fragmentation. Uh, that's not that big of a deal either because if I'm, say I hold the right latch on this, if I delete, say, this, this entry here, I could just recompact re everything. It's not too bad. Think of like searching. So some of it's the same problem as the T tree, right? So when I come down here and I want to say find, find Obama, I'm going to do binary search on this thing. Or I could do linear search. Let's say I'm doing binary search, right? So in order for me to check what the actual value of this key is, I gotta follow this pointer. Now this is just an offset in my node, so it's not like a full 64-bit pointer, but it's very likely that the, this thing here is not gonna be in the same cache line as this thing here. So 
as I'm doing my search within the node itself, I'm going to have multiple cache line uh, fills. Right? How big is the cache line in x86? I heard it. 64 bytes. 64 bytes. 64 bytes. Yes. So say I'm storing these as 16, 16, um, say 16-bit 16 integers. So that's two bytes. Right? I can have a bunch of these and a bunch of these, and that's not, not all not going to fit in, in a single cache line. Right? Restart Windows. No. <laughs> okay, sorry. So, what's the one easy trick I could do? So, if I want to do a search, right, in this case here, in this example here, the first character in all of these strings or keys that I'm storing in my index, they're all different. L A P O, right? So I could actually just embed the first character up in here. So now when I'm doing binary search, if I'm looking for Obama, or I say I'm doing just a linear search in this, I can just scan along these guys, see L O L A L O O. I might have a match there, so then I follow my pointer. So it's one cache line you know, uh, fill for this thing, and then potentially one, at least one cache line fill to go jump down here right, without having to just go back and forth nonstop. Right, I'm only showing four keys here, but imagine if you had you know, 64 keys inside of this thing. Right? You still have to go always check, because right? this, this thing might be, this might be Oprah here instead of Obama. So if I'm looking for Obama, I still have to go look at this thing. But I can skip a bunch of other uh, pointers by just jumping to this, or by only looking at the ones that at least start with O. So, this seems nice, right? In actuality, in, in most, most indexes, this may not always work, right? Because in this case here, again, the first character of every single key was completely different. In real data sets, it's not going to be completely different like that, right? It's going to look something like this, where there is going to be uh, the, the first couple characters are probably going to be the same, right? And think of like if you're storing. This is a trivial example. You wouldn't actually do it this way, but think you're storing the list of URLs, right, that you've crawled on the web. A bunch of them are going to start with www, you know, www dot and then something. So that first three characters, the four characters, will be exactly the same. So that little trick we just did in the last slide isn't going to work. So we can do something else. We can do what's called prefix compression. So now down in our leaf node, because it's a sorted array, that, that it's very likely that the first couple characters within our node uh, or, or digits within our node are going to be the same. So in this case here, instead of storing the complete key with the duplicated uh, prefix for all three keys, we can instead store the prefix separately. And then now for the, for the keys, we just store the part that's actually different from them. Right? So we go from rob, robbing robot, to just storing the prefix rob, and then BED, BING, and then OT. Right? Again, you wouldn't want to do this for the, I guess you could do this for the, the internets too, but this is mostly more common in, in, the, uh, in the leaf nodes. So we can go the other direction, right? So this is taking the prefix and finding where the overlap is, but we can also do, recognize that it's, sometimes the prefix is all we really need, and we can throw away everything else. So this is called suffix truncation, um, which I guess is, is sort of a variant of a prefix compression. But the idea here is that in our inner nodes, we can recognize that we only really need maybe the first three, for three characters for these two keys for us to be able to differentiate one versus the other. So the idea is that we can just take these guys, only store them, throw away the rest, and that's enough for us to figure out whether we want to go left or right as we traverse our index. So the, again, we can do this because in a B plus tree, it's because these are just copies of the keys, right? We're not, we don't need these to have a complete copy of the key in the inner nodes to check for existence. The only way we can check for existence is if we go to the leaf nodes, and in which case we have to have the complete key to make sure we have an exact match. So this now leads into talking about tries. So again, this says exactly what I said. Anytime we want to do a lookup to see whether a key exists in our B plus tree, we always have to get to a leaf node, right? Because the inner nodes may or may not have keys 
that still exist in our, in, our, in our index, in our corpus, but the leaf nodes will always have everything. So no matter what, no matter what key we're looking for, and when we do a lookup in a B plus tree, it's always lo o, uh, o log n. We always have to get to the bottom, even though our key may not exist, all right? So now we start thinking about performance. Again, thinking of the context of cache lines. So we know that there's going to be at least one cache line fill for every single level in the tree. Right? Assume nothing, nothing, our tree is completely out of cache, so every single level will have to be a cache line lookup in memory to bring it into L1, and then we can do our lookup on it. Right? And going out to memory is super slow. Right? It's faster than disk, but still way slower than, uh, than you know, reading, reading L1, L2, L3. So in that case here, even though we may be looking up for keys that don't actually exist in our index, we always have to get to the bottom. We have to always get the leaf nodes. So this is where tries are coming. Tries are a different alternative to storing indexes, or, or storing datas and keys in or indexes. So the, the, the naming for these things are quite confusing. So tries are sort of the, the accepted term for what I'm describing here. Uh, sometimes they're called digital search trees or prefix trees. And then there's variants of tries, which are the radix trees and patricia trees. And sometimes they'll say patricia trees or radix trees are the same thing as tries. My understanding is that they're not. Uh, so these are, what I'll describe first are tries, and then we'll switch over to talk about radix trees in a second. Okay? All right, so the basic idea of a, of a try is that rather than storing the entire key at, at different levels in the tree, we're going to break up the keys into digits. All right, so if, if, it's, if it's a string, it'd be one character would be a digit. If it's an integer, it could be a single bit. It could be a byte. Right? Depends on how you implement it. And we're going to store these uh, digits separately at different levels in the tree, or the try, excuse me. And then now when we want to see whether a key exists, we're going to do a one-by-one -one comparison of each digit in our key and in, in the try as we do our traversal. And so because what will happen is we may reach the point where the digit that we have in our key that we're do doing the lookup on doesn't exist at the level we're at in our try. And at that point, we know the key cannot exist. Right? It's not like a B plus tree where some inner nodes may have keys that have been long deleted. Everything that exists in the try has to exist at different levels, at, 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 the, at the correct level. All right? So say we have a simple try like this, and we have three keys. Hello, hat, and have. So if we want to do a lookup on hello, again, we're going to break up the string into each, each character will be correspond to a digit. So we do a lookup on h here. Then this, this tells us to traverse down to this node here. We find that we have the e, which is in the second position. And then we have llo, and then the pointer to our, our tuple. Right? So tries were first discovered in 1959 by this French dude. Um, and then there was this other guy, actually in the U.S., named Edward Fenkin. He then coined the term try, which is supposed to mean retrieval tree, a few years after the, the first thing was implemented. Um, Edward Fenkin apparently is faculty at CMU. If you look on the website, he's there. I've never met him. He's old. Uh, I think he's still alive. Um, but apparently the guy that coined tr try is at CMU, but uh, somewhere. So tries are interesting, and they have some unique properties that are different than... Uh, than what we talked about for in B plus trees. So the first is that the shape of the try, the actual, what the physical data stru structure looks like, you know, what levels you have, what nodes you have, things like that, <coughs> it actually depends on the, on the keys that already exist in the, in the try and not in the order you insert them. So the way you think about this is like, if I have a, a B plus tree and I shuffle up the keys I, that I want to insert into it, I may actually get a different physical data structure because depending on when it, does, when it does splits and merges from one shuffle order to another shuffle order. In the case of a try, it's always, since it's deterministic, it's always going to have the same physical layout, right? no matter what order I, I, I insert them. The other interesting aspect then is that it's not going to require any rebalancing operations like you have to do in a, in a B plus tree. Right? You still have to do potentially splits and merges based on the size of the nodes, as we'll see this in the art index in, in a second. But it's not, 
you're not doing major changes in order to rebalance things in the same way that you have to do in a B plus tree. Like the changes you're making will be localized. So now the complexity of this is, is, is different because it's not based on the number of keys, but it's actually based on the length of the key that you're trying to do a lookup on. Right? So the length of the key is k. The complexity of any operation on this is OK. Right? So think about this. And if I go back to my, my example here, so if I want to do a lookup on hello, right, the complexity is going to be five lookups right, to get down to here. But if I want to do a lookup on Andy, at the very first node, I would see there's no A there. The first character in Andy is A. There's no A in the first position here at the first level of my try. Therefore, my search is done. Right? So worst case scenario, I'd have to go A, A and D, Y. But in the best case scenario, I stop immediately. Right? And that's different than, than in a B plus tree. Right? So again, another important thing about this is the keys themselves are not actually stored in their entire form since they're broken up into digits. Uh, if we want to be able to put the key back together, we have to, we have to figure out what the path is. Right? And that'll, that we have to do extra more, we have to do more work when we want to do scans because we just can't scan along the leaf nodes if we can in B plus tree. We have to backtrack and, and reconstruct things. So the key design decision you have to make when you build a try is called the span. So the span is going to determine at each level the number of bits of, of, that you're going to represent for a digit or a key or, or the prefix, right? So it's, the way it works is that for each digit I'm storing in a level. If the digit exists in my corpus, meaning I, I was, a key got inserted that has this digit at this position in my try, then I'm going to have a pointer to either the, the, the tuple that corresponds to it, if I'm at the end of the key, or a pointer to the node below it. Otherwise, I'll store a null pointer. So the span will end up determining what's called the fan out. Right? And this will determine the number of branches you're going to have at a particular node in the try. Right? The, the, the maximum number of branches you can have. Right? And then this, in turn, determines the, the, the height of the, of the, of the, uh, of the tree. Right? So if you have a, if your span is one bit, then you're going to have to store, you know, for 32-bit integer, you have to store at least 32, 32 levels. Um, but if you're doing one byte, which is 8 bits, then you only have to store four levels. So another thing you'll see also in the literature too, they'll refer to things as an n-way try, like a 256-way try. All right? And that determine, that's based on the fan out. So 256-way try means that at a particular node, there's 256 branches to children, All right, at, at, at most. So let's look at a simple example of how we actually want to store a one-bit span try. And so for this one, we're going to store three keys, uh, uh, 10, 25, and 31. So a one-bit span try means that at every single level in the try, we're going to represent one bit, a one-bit digit. So we're going, to, we're going to convert our keys into uh, to a binary form, right? And these are going to be two, uh, two, eight, eight, two eight bit uh, uh, words. So we're going to represent our integers as 16 bits just for simplicity reason. But in, in a real system, it could be 32 bits or 64 bits. All right, so our try is going to look like this. So at the very first level here, right, that corresponds to the first position in our in our, or in our, our digits for our, in binary form. So in this case here, all three are zeros. So at our try node for position for, for, for bit zero, for, when the bit equals zero, we have a pointer to the child node. But for bit equals one, we have a null pointer. Right? Then we go to the next position, and this one's zero again. And then for simplicity, I'm, you know, this thing would be get repeated 10 times, but I'm not going to do that. This is sort of Imagine this thing gets repeated 10 times, right? Because it's the same thing. It's all zeros. So the zero position will have a pointer to the child, and then the one will be null, right? So then we get down here. And now we actually do our branching, because for key 10, the, the, the bit of this position is zero. But for key 25 and 31, the bit position is, is one. So we'll have a branch go down this side correspond to where key 25 is and a branch for this side for key 25, sorry, this is key 10, this is key 25, 31, because they have one. So there's a pointer from down here to one. All right, so let's look at this point here. So for the remaining four bits in key 10, 
right? There's no other branching here, so we just have one pointer, zero pointer, one pointer, and then at the bottom here, we have our pointer to, to our actual tuple, right? For these guys here, they're the same for the next position. They both have one. Then they split off here, zero and one. So 20, 25 goes down here, and 31 goes down here, right? Pretty straightforward. So what's one easy optimization we could do for this to reduce the amount of memory we're storing per node? Compress nodes that only have one child and have a variable length prefix. He said compress nodes that only have one child and have a variable length prefix. So that'll do vertical compression. That'll reduce the path. What's one way to compress in the node itself? It's called horizontal compression. So what am I doing stupid here? Well, I'm storing the value 0 and the value 1 followed by the pointer, right? I don't need to do that, right? So instead, I just store a you know, two-element array. I know the first offset is 0, the second offset is 1, and I'm done, right? So now for each node, I've stored, instead of having to store you know, the, the, the one bit followed by a pointer and then another bit followed by a pointer, I'm just storing two pointers. And implicitly, the offset of the pointer corresponds to the, the value of the digit at this level. Yes? So like, if you have like a sparsely populated alphabet, what does that mean you're allocating uh, different alphabet size arrays for every node? So his comment is, if I have a sparsely populated alphabet, does that mean I'm going to allocate a slot or an offset for every single character, but most of those characters end up being null? Yes, we'll come to that in a second. And that's sort of what the art index and the Judy arrays do. So now the second optimization is exactly what he said here. So you see I have these two, these three branches here. So this is 10, this is 25, this is 31. So at this point here, after I branch at, the, at this bit position, there's no other branch, right? It's, it's a straight line shot down to the tuple pointer here. So I don't actually care what are all the bits that are stored in here, all right? I, just, I can shortcut it and just get to here. Same thing for this. At this point here, I, there's no other branch at this, at this node here, so I could just move that up. Same one here, I can just move that up. So this is what a radix tree is. So a radix tree is going to omit any node where there's only a single child. Right? So that, this is vertical compression. So the idea here is that, again, this is the same try we had before, but now I'm, you know, I'm compressing it. So at this point here, when this guy pointed down to this path and nobody else pointed to it, I can just store a pointer to the tuple, right? It's basically saying the, the path here ends, the key that you, that, that you were looking for that I know about has to be in here. Now, of course, someone could do a lookup and say, oh, I'm looking for something that has, you know, bit zero, bit zero, bit zero, and then maybe differs in that somewhere down the path here. My try doesn't know about it, Right, so it can't store that. So that means that I still have to follow the pointer now to go to the actual tuple itself and figure out whether I actually have a match or not. And you know, that sounds like a T tree, but like we're only doing it at the end. We're gonna have to do the lookup anyway on the tuple. So th this is fine. Now it prevents us from, from being uncovering index because we still have to go look at the tuple, but again, we can cover that later. Yes. Can't you store the bit pattern on the edge that you compressed? So he says, couldn't you store the bit pattern here that did, you compressed uh, just up in here and then do exact match? Yes, you could do that. And Judy Ray's do that in a second. Yes. OK. So this, these are the basics of, of what a, a radix tree in our try is. So for re the remaining part of the class, I actually want to talk about how do, you, how do you actually implement this. And for this, I'm going to. First, talk about Judy arrays, which I don't think is covered or mentioned in the, 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 the German paper you guys read, right? right? But this is this often comes up when people say, talk about art indexes outside of databases, they're like, this sounds like Judy arrays. And it does. It, it is very similar. So I want to describe to you what Judy arrays are, and then it'll help motivate what Hyper actually does for the art index, and then we'll finish up talking about uh, the mastery in silo. Right? So Judy arrays and art indexes are going to be 256-way radix trees. The, the mass tree is going to be a try of trees. 
Uh, it's a different way of representing the, the actual nodes themselves. Okay? All right. So Judy arrays were invented back in 2000 by these guys at HP Labs. Uh, the guy, it's named Judy after the guy who's invented it. It's his sister. Um, there's also Patricia Trees, which I think they're not named after another a woman. It's just, I think they just picked a random name for some reason. Right? Um, so Judy arrays are named after the guy's sister. It's a 256 away radix tree. And the reason why this is interesting is this is the first known radix tree implementation that supports adaptive uh, node representation or adaptive node layouts, which is what the art index is, the A in art stands for, the, the adaptive rate extreme. So Judy array is gonna have three different types. Uh, it's gonna have a one bit, a bit array, a uh, integer map, and then a string map. We're gonna focus on the Judy L, which is the, the integer map, because that, that'll map directly into what we're talking about with, uh, with the art index. But the basic idea is the same thing if you wanna do a string array. So, this was invented in the late 1990s, uh, early 2000s at HP. HP filed a patent for this in 2000. It expires in 2022. There is an open source L LPGPL implementation. If you read Hacker News, they're all freaked out about this, but the patent saying, like, you don't want to use this, HP is going to come sue you. If you follow this link here, there's a posting on the mailing list where somebody asked the, 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 when the, one of the Judy Ray authors, like, hey, there's this patent, should I freak out about it? And they said basically no. Um, but my understanding is that nobody actually implements the Judy arrays because uh, it's actually quite difficult to do. It's not, like if, if you go read the manual for it, which I did this weekend, it's like 80 something pages. It's, it's pretty complex. Um, in my opinion, the art index is, is, is easier to implement, but I might be biased because I like the Germans. Anyway, but the, the, the basic idea at a high level, the same thing we're gonna do in art index, the Judy Arrays guy did, guys did first. So now, actually, one thing that is different than art, which is unique, and as far as you know, this is the only uh, the only data structure that I know about that does something like this, is that instead of storing the metadata about each node in the header of the node, right? In most implementations, you do that. Like in the B plus tree node, at the header, you would say, like, you know, I have this number of keys. I have uh, here's my lower bound and upper bound. Here's my slot array, or here's some information about you know what's in the node itself. Instead of storing that in the node in the Judy array, they're actually going to store this in the pointer to the node. So they call these Judy pointers. Uh, there's this great paper from Jens Dietrich out of Germany where he does an evaluation of Judy arrays versus the, the art index um, from ICD 2015. They call these things fat pointers. It's basically you think of like every pointer now. To, to another node inside my index is now going to be 128 bits. Right? It's going to mean the double the, 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 the word size, the double the regular the pointer size. So I'm going to have 128 bits pointer to my child. And in that 128 bits, in addition to storing the 64 bit pointer to the actual memory location of that node, I'm also going to store all that metadata that I would normally keep in the header of the node itself. Right? So I'll keep track of what the node type is, what, what's the memory layout. How many, how many entries or keys that it has, or digits that it has. Uh, and if I am actually wanted to store to the pointer itself, to the tuple, instead of actually to a node, I can embed what the value is, or the, the, the remaining digits that he mentioned, in the pointer itself, um, and then if necessary, a, a, a pointer to things. So again, this part is unique. The art index doesn't do this. Most, I don't know if any other index does this, of actually storing the metadata about the, point, the, the, the node in the pointer to the node. And we can do this because every child node in our tree only has one parent in a, in a, in a tri or a radix tree. So there's only one location where you have to keep that in sync. It's not like we have sibling pointers to be able to scan across the leaf nodes. So, so in a B plus tree, this would be hard to do. In a radix tree, we can do something like this. All right, so every node is going to be able to store 256 digits. All right, so it's a 256 way tri. The, deal, the issue is going to be the same thing he brought up, is that all of our nodes are not going to be 100% full. Right? In, in, in many cases, like as you traverse down to the tree, right, say you're storing URLs, the, the top of the tree could have you know, dub, dub, dub as, as for a URL that everyone uses, but then everything else is going to be completely different. And then maybe as I go down the tree, then my, my fan out gets larger and I'm having more, more keys as I go along. Or more digits as I go along. 
So what they're going to do is they're going to have three different node types that they can switch between based on what the distribution of the population of the digits at that particular node or at that particular level in the tribe. So you have a linear node for sparse populations. Again, I'll, I'll go through these two in a second. Right? So this is when you don't have a, you have a small number of keys or digits at a, at a, at a node. Bitmap node is when you have a little bit more. And then uncompressed node is when you just have a complete dense population. Right? When, it may not be entirely 256 digits, but it's, it's more than you can actually store in, in these two guys here. So we'll see this in a second when we talk about art index. The linear node will map to the two smallest node types in art, and then they'll also have the uncompressed node, that's the largest node type in art, and then what they do here is different, that what Judy Rays do is different than what art does, like the, the bitmap node. All right, so again, the linear node is for when you have a small number of, of digits or, or in, in, in your population at a particular node. So what you're going to do is that you're just going to store two arrays in the node that can store up to six keys or six digits. And so the first part of the array will be sorted digits. And this will be whatever digits are actually being stored. You're actually storing a copy of that digit in the array. And then you have the child pointers where the offset in this array corresponds to what the offset of the key as it exists here. So again, it's called a linear node because when you want to do a look up here, you just do a linear scan along these guys to find, find what the digit you're looking for. If you find it, then you know how far you, you've scanned along and you know how to jump into this thing. If you don't find it, then you know you're done because the, the digit you're looking for isn't there. So in the original specification of the Judy arrays from, from 15, 20 years ago, they talk about how a linear node could be accessed with a single cache line. Right? They had 32-bit pointers. So they could store at most seven keys in this to, to, to make it fit in a single cache line. Because again, these are the, 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 Judy array, the Judy pointers. So these are, you know, these should be double the regular pointer size. So if it was 32-bit addresses, addresses, then it was 64 bits. In our world now, though, these are now going to be 128 bits. So I can store at most six uh, digits on this side. So each digit is a single byte. So I have six bytes here. And then I can store six, six digits or six fat pointers here, that are going to be 16 bytes because a regular pointer is 8 bytes. So these are 96 bytes. So in total, I have 102 bytes. That's not cache aligned, cache line aligned, so I have to pad this out. So now to get it to be exactly two cache lines, I just add my extra bytes to make it 128 bytes. I think the, the alignment size for x86 is 16 bytes. Um, so if you, you could align it that way, but for simplicity, we'll just say it's, it's uh, two cache lines, 128 bytes. Again, in the, original, um, in the original paper, or the original Judy specification, this would be 64 bytes, because your, your, your pointers would be much, much smaller. So again, at a particular node, at a particular level, in our try, in our radix tree, if that node only has six or less digits, then we can use something like this. If we have more, then we have to convert that node into one of the larger node types. And the next larger node type is called a bitmap node. So the way this is going to work is that we're going to maintain a bitmap of whether a key, whether the digit exists at our node. Uh, just, so we record one or zero whether that digit exists in our node. And then we're going to break up that 206 bitmap, a 206 bit bitmap, into uh, one byte chunks, so eight bits. And then at the end of every chunk, there'll be a pointer now down to our child pointers. So here we have our prefix bitmaps. And again, think of this as like, I have my uh, eight bits. And when it's all zeros, that's the first position. When the, the next, the, you know, you, you increment one to that, that goes in the next position. Increment one to that, go, that goes in the next position, right? So I know how to jump to these different offsets or where I need to look to see whether my digit exists, because I know what my bit sequence looks like, and I know how this is all fixed length here, right? So then again, these are just now pointers down to the subarray here that tell me where my starting location is for the child array pointers that course, or ch the child node pointers that correspond to my segment like this, right? And then these are our, our, our 128 bit pointers down to the nodes below us. So say I want to do, do a look up here on digit on, with value, uh, you know, seven, seven zeros followed by a one. So that would go look up in here, and that would be in my first position, or sorry, the second position here. 
And then now I just count the number of ones that came before me in this, and that will tell me where I need to jump to at the starting location of my subarray pointer here. So for this guy here, I'm in the second position, but there's no other one to, to the left of me. So therefore, I know my offset is zero. So I follow this pointer down here and jump to offset zero, which is just the beginning here. So this pointer here corresponds to the digit that was stored at this position here. Right? Same thing for this guy. He's got only one, uh, one, one to the left of him. So he's here. This one here is there. And then now I start to with the next sequence. So again, so we can do this uh, when we have at least uh, I forget the exact number how you actually how many I forget how many you can store in here, but it's less than because you're, you're this has always been the same size, right? To, up to two hundred fifty six different bits or different digits, and then this thing I forget the, the max size is, right? It has to be able to fit in in our cache lines. So though, if our again our node doesn't fit or the, the number of digits we have doesn't fit into this then we have to use the uncompressed one, which is just an array of, uh, of child pointers, where the offset corresponds to whether the, the digit exists. OK, so is this clear? All right, so now we can talk about the art index. So the art index, again, it's going to look like a lot like the Judy array, where it's going to be 256-way radix tree. Um, and depending on the population at a particular node, we're going to choose different node sizes, some different node layouts. So this was developed by our good friends in Germany for the Hyper system in 2013. Um, I think they're using this for the new system they're building called Umbra, which is not out yet. Um, I think they're, it's, they're still reuse, reusing the, the art index. So in the original paper from 2013, uh, it was single-threaded, didn't support concurrent operations. So the paper I had you guys read in 2015 was the newer one, describes how to actually how to do this in how to make it thread safe. All right, so let's compare now what the Judy arrays look like, or how, how Judy arrays are different than the art index. So for the node types, for the they're going to be slightly different, right? They're still going to have the uncompressed node, but they'll and have the linear node. But it's that middle region instead of a bitmap node, they'll have another node type. And in the case of Judy arrays, they had three node types. In the uh, in the art index, they have four node types. The other thing to think about too is also is that the Judy array is meant to be this general purpose, like map, a general purpose associative array. So that means that they have to have the complete copy of the key in, in the array. So they're not going to be able to do the, 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 the vertical compression where you're lopping off uh, large segments of the branches when you know there's no other children. Um, they had to complete, keep a complete copy of everything. And then down here in the art index, since it's a table index, we don't have to worry about uh, you know, losing keys if we truncate our branches, we can always go back to the, the, the actual table itself and, and figure out what the original key was and rebuild the index as needed. All right, so let's talk about the different node types. So the first two node types are the smallest ones, and this is where you're going to store, uh, uh, w when you have a small number of digits that exist at a given node. So again, every node in the in the and the data structure logically could have 256 branches, right? Because we're doing 8-bit spans, 1-byte spans. So at most, there could be 256 unique values or new digits at our node. But again, since we know that some distributions are not going to have all digits at a particular node, we can choose to use these more compressed uh, node types. So with uh, node 4, we can have four, at most 4 values. Again, this is just an array of the sorted digits. And then we have the, the child pointers. In the case of art, they're not using the fat pointers that, that Judy arrays do. So these are just 64 bits to our children. And then the offset of our, of our key in, in the sort of digit array corresponds to the offset to the child pointer here. Another aspect of art index that they described in the original paper was you can actually use SIMD or vectorized instructions to do these searches very efficiently. Right? So with SIMD instructions, I can take all uh, four digits, put it into a SIMD register, and do one instruction to do a comparison of them. Right? I don't have to do the linear scan across them and look at them one by one. By one. For node 16, it's at, it's at most 16 values. So I'm going to have a, a, a 16 slots in my sort of digit array and then 16 pointers here. Right? So it's when you now get to something that doesn't fit in the other two nodes, 
uh, this is where it gets different than the Judy array. So in the Judy array, you would have the bitmap index where you have, again, the offsets. You have the bitmap array, then you have a pointer down to the, the subarray for your children pointers. In, uh, in Art, what they're going to do is that instead of actually storing the values of the digits as we did in the previous one, we're just going to have a 236 length uh, uh, array of pointers that then point to offsets within our child pointers over here, right? So the idea here is that because we only need to store, I think these are one byte, so eight bits, to know what offset we need to jump into this array here, that we don't have to store you know, a full 32-bit 30, or 64-bit pointer for this array here. So the size of this thing is actually quite small. Right? And so the max number of entries you can store in this array type is 48. Right, so the since these are 64-bit pointers, in order to get everything to fit into uh, two cache lines, I think, right? So this is 286 bits because each of those are one bytes, and then you have 384 bytes for for these 48 pointers. Actually, the total size is 600, 640 bytes, which I think is like five or six cache lines, right? So again, the argument that they make is that instead of actually doing the linear scan or the vectorized scan that we did back here. Right? Instead of scanning along this, this thing here to figure out is the key I'm looking for, the digit I'm looking for in my array, by just having this offset thing, since I know exactly what the bit sequence is for my, the key I'm looking up, the digit I'm looking up, I know how to jump immediately into that array, and then that'll then tell me how to point over, over into uh, this, the second array to get into the child pointer that I want. So they're sort of balancing the, the computational overhead of scanning this thing versus the memory overhead of, uh, of you know, storing this, this larger array. Because right? what I could do is I could have just st stored the, the digits that I want up to, to, to 48 slots and then have pointers over there, but this actually gives you the, the best performance, the, the amount of storage you're using. All right, so now the last node type is corresponds to the uncompressed node type in the Judy array, which I didn't cover. But the basic idea is, again, it's just like before where I don't actually store the digits. I just have a, a giant array up to 256 slots. And then I have either a null or a child pointer based on whether the, the digit exists at this particular node. Right? And again, then now it's super fast to go do a lookup. Again, I just find my position. And then if it's null, I'm done. If it's a pointer, then I follow that. So this is clear what the node types are. Okay, so another cool thing about the art index, what I liked, the paper, is that they talk about how you actually can store any possible key in a radix tree or, or, or tri data structure, right? And in, when I first did my first example, I just did the, the three strings. And for, that, for us, looking at this as humans, it's really easy for us to see, oh yeah, you just take the, you know, one character corresponds to one, one, you know, one level in the tri. But when we actually want to go implement, implement this in real hardware, then we find out that the, the way the CPU may be representing different data types are not amenable to be storing in a tri data structure. So for unsigned integers, it's fairly easy to understand, except that if we're running on x86, x86 is going to be little endian, and we actually want to store things in big endian, which I'll show in the next slide. But for sign integers, you know, we have the two's complement bits at the beginning. So if we actually just store those bits directly in our index, in our tri data structure at a, at, a, at a level, at a node, then that's going to be cause problems because that may, may not be what we're actually looking for when, when we do our comparisons. Well, of course, now if it's flipped when we're doing a uh, little endian, now we're coming in the wrong direction. We won't know whether something's negative or positive until we get to the very end. So they flip that around to make sure that uh, that negative numbers are always smaller than the positive numbers. For floats, they, they break them up into uh, normalized or denormalized, positive versus negative, and then always store things as unsigned integer to do comparisons better. If you have a compound key, which is very common, like I have an index that's on multiple attributes, I just do the transformation to, 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 to the comparable form for each one separately, right? and, and just concatenate them as a, as a, long, as a long key. So let me show an example of what I mean by this, right? So say we have uh, this key here. And for simplicity, we're going to store this as a hexadecimal number. 
right? So zero, zero A, zero B, zero C, zero D. So if I store this in, uh, in little endian, which is Intel does, then if I start from the top to the bottom, I'm going in the wrong direction. And I won't be able to know whether the value that I'm looking for uh, is less than or greater than this particular key until I get to the very bottom. But if I store it in big endian, then I know I'm looking at the most significant bit over here, and I can know right away whether the value I'm looking for is less than or greater than or equal to the, 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 uh, the first digit in my sequence space here. So again, to explain why this matters a bit more, let's say I want to do a lookup like this, uh, 65, or 650,000. If I represent it in hexadecimal form, if I store it in uh, big endian form, then when I do my traversal, I know exactly at the first position here, 0a equals 0a, 0b equals this, and then 1d is what I want here, and then I follow down here. If I was doing it in the other direction, then I would look at 1d, 0d, and this would end up being greater than this, which is not true because this is less than this, right? So in the, in the, the first art index paper, they basically give you a recipe book on how to con do conversions of all the different possible key, key types you want to store in our index to make sure that they have this, uh, this, this, this correct form when we want to do our comparisons in the index. All right, is this clear? Okay. All right, so now we can get to the paper that you guys read. Um, so the first thing to point out is that the art index is not a latch-free data structure. They talk about how they could make it latch-free, but this would require a major uh, engineering work, a major engineering effort to reorganize the data structure to, to be able to, to achieve this. And as we, you guys in the paper you read last class uh, about, the, about the BW tree, Lat tree doesn't make it make it much better. Doesn't make it better at all, and and turns out it's going to be much worse. So you'd have to do a bunch of extra stuff in your in in the art index, like bring in the mapping table or delta storage, delta version chains, like in the BW tree, in order to make it lat tree. And they argue it's not worth it. So they instead propose two different approaches to do uh, latching. So they have optimistic latch coupling or lock coupling is what they call it in the paper, and then the read optimized write exclusion. So I'm going to focus on this one because I think it's the easiest one to understand, and this is what we actually implemented in the B, the B plus tree that we benchmarked in the paper you guys had last class. I, I think this is the right way to do this. So the basic idea of optimistic lat, latch coupling is that we're going to add now a version counter to every single node in our index, and any single any time that a uh, writer thread wants to modify the node. They acquire the right latch and increment that version counter. Now, any reader thread comes along. They don't have to take any latches. They just check to see whether the right latch is, is being held on a node. If not, then they can read it. And then they read that version number. Then they do whatever they need to do and then go on to the next node. Before they can finish doing whatever they want to do in the next node, they go back and look to see whether the version counter of that node it just came from is the same what it read before. If it is, then it knows that no other thread has come along and modified that node in between the time it, it, it checked it and then read it and moved on. Right, so you're optimistically assuming that no one's going to modify the node, so you don't require any latches, but you still do that sort of sort of coupling as you go down to check to check behind you to make sure things are okay. So the to make all this work is we have to use that epoch-based garbage collection that we talked about before, because again, we don't want writer threads to modify nodes and then blow them away as if they're doing deletes or, or doing splits and merges, and then we end up following a pointer to, to nowhere. Right? So the epoch-based garbage collection will make sure that any node that we're reading, all the pointers and everything will still be there as we follow the, the pointer to the next node. It's just that it may logically have been uh, modified by another writer thread, and in which case we abort ourselves and restart. So let's look at an example here. So again, I'm switching to the B plus tree because I think this is easier to understand, but you can do basically the same idea in a art index. So I'm going to have a thread come along, or sorry, every, every, um, every node now has this version number, and for that, a thread to come along, I want to do a lookup on key 44. So here we start at the beginning. We don't acquire any right latches, but we just check to see whether, or read latches, we check to see whether the right latch is being held. If not, then we go look up what the version number is, 
do whatever it is we need to do, examine the keys to figure out what, what direction we want to go for our traversal, and then move to our next node here. Now, we read this snapshot here, version 5, but then before we can do any examination in, in this node here, we got to go make sure that this is actually where we should be. So we just go back and check the version number from the node we came from. So we maintain a stack with a list of, of what nodes we're looking at as we go down. And if the version number for this thing is the same what we saw at the very beginning, then we know that no other thread has modified this node since we first started at it. So therefore, it's safe for us to proceed down further. All right. Again, so now I do my check from V3. That, that gets validated. Uh, I can do my examination on this node here. Then I realize I need to go down here, check that uh, this version number, go back and recheck version 5. That passed. That hasn't been changed. So now for I can, I can examine my node and find the key that I'm looking for. All right. So you're optimistically assuming that no other thread's going to modify the node you just came from, so you don't acquire any latches on it as you go. So let's look at an example. Let's roll back to say before we, uh, we, we got down here and read this version 9 here, before we do our check on, the, on this node C, we have a writer thread that comes along. They flip the, the right latch, which you can do because I'm not there anymore, right? But I, di I didn't acquire a latch anyway. And then it modified this node, modified this node, and then update this version number. So now, when I do my recheck to see whether the node it came from is still the same, I would see now that it's no longer version 5, it's now version 6. And I would say, all right, now I know someone has, abort has modified this, this, this node since I came through, so I would abort my operation, all right, back out, and come back and do it all over again. So this is more light lightweight than having to take relatches. Um, but you still have to take right latches to protect things. We just check to see whether the right latch is being held. If not, then you go ahead and read things. So the downside of this approach, though, is that it's kind of heavyweight, of course grained. So in this example here, all I did was check to see whether the version number has changed. Like I went from 5 to 6. And then I saw I didn't have a match, and I killed myself. But this thread here, the writer thread, Let's say all they really did was just update whatever this pointer was down to this node here, right? It didn't touch anything going in this direction here. So in actuality, there's not really a conflict because this side of the tree that I went down is still fine, it's still sound, it's still the same. But I don't know that. All I know is that they modified this and incremented it. And therefore, I have to abort. So this is unnecessary abort. This is like a false, false conflict because um, these version numbers are too, too coarse grained. The alternative would be what's called the read-optimized write exclusion. And we're short on time, so I'm going to go into detail. But the, basically, the idea is that every node is going to have an exclusive latch, and they're going to block other readers, but they're never going to block write. Sorry, question, yes? Uh, could you please return to the, yeah, uh, perhaps it's a stupid question, but I don't quite understand that. Why do, you, why do you have to examine the version of your parent instead of the node that you're currently reading? So this question is, if I'm, say I'm here, I jump down here, why do I have to examine what this version is and not this version here? Well, you, so you record what this version is, but the idea is that I follow some pointer down to my node here, because this is where I should, I should have gone. And so if now someone comes and modifies what this pointer is in between before I, I, I or after, I, after I've already checked it, then this is not the version I should be reading. I should be reading some other thing. And now I'm not seeing a consistent version of, 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 the, uh, of the index. Mm, yeah, I mean that, for example, someone has changed my parent, um, but, but whatsoever, I'm in the correct node that I'm going to read. So I, uh, what could be the situation that not checking my parent is wrong? So this question is, uh, what could be the situation where not checking my parent causes a problem? Because I'm already down here. Um, let's say we're back up here. So, because I think there's a there's a race condition where someone could could like I could come here and I follow this pointer. This pointer is going to take me to this node here, but in between that time, before I actually jump here, somebody else has has 
decouple this pointer now to have the no below me, say there's another level, and actually the thing I want to get to is, is over here, not through this, and then this thing doesn't actually point to it. Okay, so it means that, for example, I'm in the node Z in showing the graph, but actually after some writers have modified C, I, had, I should have gone to some other node yes. instead of G, so yes. I'm so I pull that. Yes, correct, yes. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so real quickly, the, the read optimized read exclusion, like the, the, the way to think about this is basically like shadow paging or MVCC, where the, the reader threads just read whatever, whatever node that it finds. Uh, the writer threads will always create new snapshots, create new nodes, um, and, they, and that way like, they block other writers from, from doing them. And then basically readers never get blocked, they never get aborted, they can always read consistent snapshots, which essentially would solve the problem that, that he, was, he was asking about. So to do this is actually quite difficult uh, because it requires major changes to the data structure in order to allow threads to make modifications to, to replace new nodes and update now all your pointers to those new nodes um, atomically. So you can do this in a radex tree because you know what you're at any node in, in, your, in the try. There's only one child pointing to you. Sorry, well, only one parent pointing to you. So I can blow away my node and atomically update my pointer without worrying about uh, anybody else or updating multiple locations at, all at once. If I'm in a B plus tree or a BW tree, since I ha well, BW tree wouldn't have this problem because you have the mapping, the, the, the mapping table. But in B plus tree, you could have sibling pointers pointing to your, to your node, and so to do a major modification of creating a whole new node and having update all your points atomically require you to hold latches or use a mapping table like a BW tree in order to make sure this happens all at once. So as far as I know, nobody actually implements this. The OLLC approach from the previous slide is, I don't, it, there's something like it's very similar in mastery um, and a couple other index, but I, I think OLLC the, from the, the, first, the previous slide is the way to go. All right, we have 10 minutes real quickly. Mastery. I just, so I'm not going to go into details about this. I just want to make you aware that it exists. So what would you see in the art index and the, and, and the Judy arrays is that the way they would manage the, 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 what's actually being stored in each different node, right? instead of having to store the giant uncompressed version every time, they would have different sizes based on the population. So instead of having different node sizes, what if you, if you just had a way to have dynamic nodes that can then grow and shrink based on the population as needed? So this is the motivation of the mastery. So the mastery, instead of having the, uh, the, 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 the dynamic node sizes, the, the adaptive node sizes, they just store a B plus tree for the node. And that thing can grow and shrink again as needed based on what keys or what digits exist at a particular node. So for this one, mastery is gonna target uh, really large keys. So think of like URLs or really big email addresses. And the size, the span of every level in the try is going to be 8 bytes, so 64 bits. Right? In the case of the Radix tree, in the case of the, uh, the duty arrays, they were doing 1 byte spans. So this is going to be 8 byte spans. Um, again, the, the idea is that in the, uh, in the leaf nodes of every B plus tree at a level, they can either point to another try level which will have its own B plus tree, or you can have a, a pointer to the, to the actual tuple itself. Right? So it's not like all the leaf nodes at the very bottom of the last level will have your, your pointers to your tuples. You can have pointers in the upper levels, just like a regular tri would as well. So this came out of the, the silo project, uh, which was, was built uh, by Eddie Kohler at Harvard. We will cover silos logging scheme in a few weeks, and we, I think we covered a little bit about, we, will, we mentioned a little bit about it when we did um, uh, concurrency control. But Silo is basically, it's like an in-memory uh, storage manager that's super optimized for, for a large number of cores. So one of the things they implemented first was this uh, try of trees, which I think is pretty interesting. So this is showing you that you don't have to store these sort of fixed size nodes in the same way that the Art Index and Judy arrays do. You can use a dynamic data structure. All right, so let's finish up the discussion about ultimate indexes by looking at this, uh, this graph that I showed you last time. So this is doing a comparison between uh, the OpenBW tree that we bid, bid her at CMU, the best known skip list out of Australia, 
our best known skip list in the world, which is from Australia. Um, a B plus tree written by the, the hyper guy who did the, the art index using his optimistic latch coupling. The mass tree, which I showed you in the last slide, and then this is the full art index, uh, again, from, from the guys from Hyper. So this is doing 50 million keys on a, a single socket machine with, with 20 threads, 10, 10 real cores, and then double with that with Hyper threading. We have insert only, read only, read update, and then scan insert. So last class, I only showed you these first, first three here. And again, across the board, the art index crushes everyone. The, the skip list is always terrible. BW tree may do better than uh, B plus tree uh, sometimes, but not always, right? So the new number I'm including now, though, is the scan insert. So this workload is you, you have some threads are scanning uh, uh, ranges in the, in the key space, and other threads are inserting, right? So now you see that the B plus tree crushes everyone here because you do those scans are super fast because now you just jump to the leaf nodes and scan along the bottom. The art index does terrible, well, it does better than the skip list, but the, the BWG actually beats it. Because again, I don't have pointers along the bottom, bottom nodes in, in, the, in the, 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 the bottom levels of the try. I have to backtrack when I want to do scans and go back up and down, sort of doing a, a breath first search to scan along my range, right? And that's why they get the worst performance here. Right, mass tree does uh, bad here. This is more of an engineering issue of way the way Eddie actually implemented scans. This is not necessarily indicative of the actual data structure. At least, at least we don't think. And of course, this again, the B, to, the B plus tree crushes everyone. All right. So now, the next question maybe is: Well, I made the claim at the beginning that the art index can actually only store. You can do the vertical compression where you only store the actual branches that have children. Uh, and you can do horizontal compression because now you can pack in, you use smaller node sizes based on the population of a particular level in the tribe. So how does it compare in memory usage versus the, the other data structures here? So again, for this one, we, we have three different key types. We have uh, monotonically increasing integers. So just think of like a, a serial key, adding one to it over and over again. We have random integers from, I think, 0 to 2 to 64. And then we have the email distribution list from the and adult website that uh, got hacked a few years ago. So these are actually real email addresses. So the, the main takeaway from this is that the art index crushes everything, with the exception of random ints. I forget why the, the B plus tree does pretty well here. Right? But in the case of monotonically increasing integers, it's, you know, it's significantly smaller than everyone else. Right? Because most of the, again, you're, increasing, you're, you're inserting keys, increasing order, those keys are going to be very similar to each other, right? Because it's just plus one, plus one, plus one, and it can pack a, a lot of data into a, a small number of nodes here. Emails are another one too, because the um, because there's a lot of overlap in the. Uh, I think we reverse them, so you, you go if it's if it's if your email address is andy.pavlo@gmail.com, you store it as com.gmail at andy.pavlo. So all these keys are going to have the same com dot at the at the beginning because we've reversed them, and that's why they get way better compression that way. That's the standard trick people do when they store URLs and email addresses. You always, you always want to reverse it. All right, so again, the art index stores less data. Uh, the BW tree, because of this uh, mapping table and the delta version chains, is, is always storing more. The skip list is always just really bad. I forget why in this one here. Oh, and the mastery, I think the reason the mastery is larger is because because it's a try of trees, all that, that B plus tree has a, a bunch of more pointers. Uh, whereas like in the, in the, the art index of regular radix tree, you don't have those additional pointers to keep track of what, what keys or digits I have in my node. All right, to finish up real quickly. So the, the basically the last two lectures was, was me telling you how wrong I was about the BW tree and latch tree data structures. Um, the, I'm of the opinion now that the, the red X trees are interesting. This is something, you know, uh, whether art index or the newer one called hot is the right way to go. I don't have a full, I I'm not 100% convinced yet. For scans, obviously it does worse. Uh, there are some other issues. Um, but just, if you have a solid B, B plus tree that's well implemented to have prefix compression or suffix truncation and a bunch of other optimiz optimizations we talked about at the beginning, I actually think that's the right data structure going forward for an in-memory database system. That if you want to be do, do fast transactions, 
because it's sort of like the the, the the like the Toyota pickup truck of indexes. It just does well in a bunch of different scenarios. All right. All right. So next class, we're start off talking about system catalogs. Uh, we're not, so the way to think about it, now we we know how to build indexes. Let's start building the rest of the system. So we'll, we'll talk about catalogs and do data layout and actually actually storing tuples. And then from there, we'll start adding layers above the storage manager, storage 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 layer, to actually execute queries and run transactions on top of that. We know how to run transactions correctly and efficiently. Let's actually look at how to run queries in it now. Okay? All right, guys. Any questions? Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I guzzle, cause I'm more a man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see saying eyes on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it. Cause ain't eyes and said, the pain I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll run head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some same knives and drink it to the studs. Billy D is the silly cheese, sit down with the weak guys. Be a man to get a can of snake eyes.